Welcome to Aurora Connects. This is episode 18 for Friday, July 31st, 2020, Masterpiece Theater. I'm Dawn Monique Williams, Associate Artistic Director at Aurora Theater. And as always, I'm joined by Artistic Director Josh Costello. Hey, Josh. Hey, Dawn. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I am okay. Josh, this is our season one Aurora Connects closer. I know, 18 weeks. It's amazing. That is astonishing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's the last day of our of our 2019-2020 season. Yes. Um, my first as artistic director and your first as associate artistic director. Congratulations on one year doing this together. Happy anniversary. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and yeah, we're going to start season two of Aurora Connects after this. Yes. Um, I have a charming little quote for us today. This is from the original Upstairs Downstairs series from 1971, before I was born. Uh, The character Sir Jeffrey Dillon says, it is my experience that that most of the harm in this world is done by people trying quite gratuitously to do more good than they can possibly achieve. Give me an honest villain every day. (laughs) Nice. My parents watched Upstairs, Downstairs, but I never got to see it. It was a little bit before our time. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. (laughs) But there was a re-up, you know, uh, uh, a re-up in in 2010. Um, I watched a few episodes, uh, mostly because of Downton Abbey, (laughs) Mm. (laughs) which is, um, you know... um, the spirit of today's episode. So before we roll into it, I just want to remind our viewers that they're welcome to comment on Facebook, um, in the YouTube chat section, and of course, email us with comments, questions, suggestions at connects at auroratheater.org. Um, and I always forget to remind folks that you can listen to Aurora Connects as an audio podcast. We're available most anywhere you get your podcasts, but certainly Stitch, Spotify and Apple podcasts. And just remember to hit like and subscribe. Yeah, so say hi in the chat. If you're watching right now, let us know you're watching. Say hello and um, and type your questions in there as well. Um, we also want to remind you that we have launched a membership program for the 2020-2021 season. Memberships get you access to all of the online programming that we are putting together, including uh, an amazing audio drama uh, written by Lauren Gunderson, Cleavon Smith, and Jonathan Spector. So please check out our membership program and join us as a member. Also, if we are able to present live uh, theater in our space, during the 2020-2021 season, your membership will get you tickets to those as well. So please check that out. And while you're there, you can click on the donation button on our website, auroratheater.org, up at the top right, click on that donation button and uh, make a donation. Help us get through uh, this crazy, crazy time. Today, we are joined by such a super cool and amazing rare guest for us. Um, Such a thrilling way to close out our first season of Roar Connects. Um, We're joined um, by Suzanne Simpson, executive producer of uh, Masterpiece uh, since November of 2019. Uh, Josh, why don't you tell us a little bit more about our guest today? Yeah, hi Suzanne. So so you're you're the executive producer of Downton Abbey, which became the most watched drama in PBS history. Yes. And uh, you're also responsible for Sherlock, Wolf Hall, and Victoria. I understand yes. you are a two-time Academy Award nominee and a two-time Emmy winner, and you were the senior producer on Nova. So I want to know, um, uh, so hi, first of all, hello, welcome to the show. You're welcome. Hi, Josh. Hi, Don. <laughs> Glad to be thank here, actually. Yeah, Very thank you so much. Time. We're so Um, giddy to have you. I'm so giddy to have you. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I want to know, when when did you know that you wanted to be the executive producer of Masterpiece? How did that all come about? Well, actually, I never really thought I ever would be the executive producer of Masterpiece because what I was interested in doing was making films. So since college, I really aspired to be a documentary filmmaker and uh, writer, producer, director. And actually I was quite fortunate in that I was able to kind of persevere and make a lot of documentaries. And my job before Masterpiece, as you said, was at Nova. And I was making both shows for television, but also IMAX films for science museums. 
And I had made a show called Shackleton's Antarctic Adventure that was a bit of a docudrama, kind of a mix of documentary and also scripted material. And I was coming into work. I had known Rebecca Eaton, who was the executive producer. She's now the executive producer at large. Um, and uh, she just sort of stopped me in the parking lot and said, do I have time for coffee? She proposed that I come work for her as a producer at Masterpiece. And of course I said, take me. Yes, I'm yours. And um, what she was trying to do was she wanted to do kind of a refresh on the Masterpiece brand. And she needed a producer to come in and, and help her make all those changes. And um, so once I was at Masterpiece, which has now been almost 14 years, uh, really, I was very lucky to have Rebecca as a mentor. And so it just in some ways felt very natural for me to come into the job as executive producer of Masterpiece. So I got very lucky. And what is, I'm curious about, you mentioned a, a refresh of the brand of Masterpiece. What did, what did, what did that entail? And, and what, was the, what was the goal of that? And how did it, how did it work out? Well, at that point, which is now back in 2007, Masterpiece ratings had been going down and they had lost the funder, the very big funder, ExxonMobil. And that meant they had a, a smaller footprint because they didn't have as much money for programming. And so Rebecca decided we really need to do something to be able to draw the attention of some sponsors who can help us then create more programming. And so she hired a consultant, focus groups happened. And what they discovered was Masterpiece was a dusty jewel in the crown mm. and that it was time to make a few changes. One of the changes to lose theater, which I know people adore and probably your people especially would, you know, want that part of it. But uh, in the focus groups, people felt that it was a little... In some ways it made the shows less accessible maybe mm. to them. And so we also needed to find a way to let people know when the type of programming was on that they liked to watch because we do all genres. We do costume dramas, we do mysteries and we do contemporary dramas. So we broke it into three sections, masterpiece classic, masterpiece mystery and masterpiece contemporary. Mm. And so in some ways, losing theater allowed us to break it into those three kind of sections. And so, and what does it mean to be the executive producer? What do you, what do you, how do you actually spend your time? What do you, what does your job uh, actually mean? Yeah. Yeah. What do I do? Um, well, besides be on Zooms all day long, like yeah. everybody else, besides that, actually, it's all about the programs. I mean, everything is all about the programs for us. So that means I spend most of my time on the telephone with our UK producers who actually make our programs, with distributors who, distributors own a lot of the companies that make this, the British drama, and with commissioners from BBC and ITV to find out what they're putting their money into so that we're kind of ahead on everything. We, we know what people are thinking even before something has been green lit. So that's a lot of what I do. And then a lot of script reading. I, I can't tell you how many scripts I'm behind right now. I think the count today was nine like nine that I have to do like immediately this weekend. So I've become, you know, the dowager countess, like what's a weekend, you know, I, it, it's basically time to sit down and read scripts. So that is the bulk of what I do that's the most important. And then of course, once we identify a program, then it's about negotiating to get the program for the price. Um, it's about looking at scripts that come in and then uh, thinking about them, giving notes back to the producers and writers, which is, it's very time consuming to do something like that. I think I had a set of scripts, six scripts. It took me five full days to actually read the scripts, think about it, write the notes, have conversations with people about it. So I would say that's the most important work I do. But I also run a team of 25 people at Masterpiece. We have a fabulous team. They're so creative. 
they're responsible for not only packaging the shows and getting them on air, but they work with the press and they try to promote our shows any way they can. And we create a lot of material like short form videos and features on the web and interviews with our talent. And actually we have a podcast too called Masterpiece Studio that goes out almost weekly. It kind of follows the episodes that we do. And uh, we, anyway, we've had some brilliant talent on that. So we're doing a lot of things um, all the time, but um, mostly it's about the programs. Um, mm -hmm. And I, since the 70s, uh, Masterpiece has been offering British programming for American audiences, um, which is some, I mean, American audiences are so fascinated with British programming, myself included. Um, and I wonder, what do you think it is that's kept Masterpiece popular for so long? And how is Masterpiece faring now in a sort of contemporary sense where we can actually just tap into BBC and, and we have the access so we don't need to necessarily go through public television? You're, you're right. Things have really changed a lot. I mean, we're coming up on our 50th year and, you know, things are different than they were in the beginning. Um, but just to answer the question about why do I think Masterpiece has lasted so long, I think of Masterpiece dramas as being like great literature or great plays, that fundamentally they're about emotional truths, love, death, courage, right and wrong. And I feel like if we're able to find those stories with such amazing actors. I mean, British, they just have the craft system down in terms of schooling, theater, television, film. They just, all the crafts are like that. And so if we're able to find those stories that I think bring forth those emotional truths very clearly, and many of the writers have had their um, start as playwrights, and then they move into screenwriting. But if we're able to find that, I think it's a very positive and self-enriching experience for people. So that what I hope we're doing is we're, we're bringing you shows that at the end of it, you go, oh my God, that was so good, right? And so that's our job is to keep finding those programs that do that. And I think if we can, I think people will keep coming back like they do for great plays and great literature. So what, what's really interesting and in how things have changed so dramatically is a BBC commissioner told me that in the old days, he would, um, a writer would call him up and say, you know, do you have time to have a drink? And they'd go to the pub and they'd sit down and the writer would start in on, you know, I have this idea. I'm not sure it's a very good idea. Maybe it's not good at all. I don't know, but I'll tell you about it. And you'll tell me if it's a good idea. And by the end of the drink, they had made a decision. That's a great idea. You should develop it. The BBC will pay for you to develop the script. Now we just have to find the right producer and the right director. And they had a deal. And then the producers, because we knew them quite well, would just pick up the phone and call Rebecca and say, you know, Rebecca, I just talked to the BBC. They're going to fund a project with this writer. Are you in? And she'd say, yeah, I love the idea. That's great. Send me the scripts when you have them. And sometimes because we were the only people who wanted those programs, you know, we were kind of the first and they would turn to us first. And we could wait if we weren't sure about something, we could say, you know, wait till we see all the scripts or tell us who gets cast in it. Today, the reason I have to pay attention to these scripts is a script comes in, I have basically a week to decide whether we're gonna do this or not do this because then who's ever producing it will take it to the open market. And then the bidding will start. And the bidding will be with Netflix, Amazon, HBO Max, you know, with everybody. So does that mean they're still going to you first? They'd like it to be on Masterpiece before they go to Netflix? I just had a call today mm -hmm. 
from, again, a longtime friend of Masterpiece who thinks, and you know, a lot of it is if they have a project that they think would really work for us, they're not coming to us with the projects that are going to cost $3 million an episode. They, their first call is Netflix or Amazon, but not everything is at that level. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, we still have weekly an audience of three to 5 million people and a very long tail because our shows now go to the PBS Masterpiece channel on Amazon. So our shows are available, you know, because a lot of people are streaming now. They're not watching television. So, uh, you know, PBS is making them available other ways. So we still are an important place, you know, for the British dramas. And we have some wonderful shows coming up. I'm just going to tell you a couple right now. Okay, great. I, I'm sure people know who Imelda Staunton is. Oh, Yes. Oh, yes. Right. And she is going to be the final uh, queen in the crown. She's already been selected for that job. But she's <laughs> in a, a murder mystery uh, that we're doing this fall called Flesh and Blood. And uh, oh, my God, it's just watching her is just everything. And Francesca Annis is also in it. Some people know who she is from masterpiece programs like Reckless. And then we have another program called Roadkill, which has Hugh Laurie playing a conservative politician. And when I mention this name, you're really going to understand why it's so good. David Hare has written it. Okay. Right? Yeah. We just did a presentation to television critics about these two upcoming programs. And we actually had David Hare and Hugh Laurie on a Zoom call with American television critics. And of course, David Hare was the smartest person in the room by far. And he said something so interesting. He's writing this contemporary drama and he's saying, I love Dickens, that's who I love. And what I aspired to with this story was to create a story that was about the most powerful people in England, you know, the prime minister and the cabinet members, all the way to women who are imprisoned. And he has achieved a story of that kind of scope in a very contemporary way. It, it's really, he's quite quite remarkable. Wow. We have a question um, from our, our chat room on YouTube asking if there are any additional episodes of Sherlock in the pipeline. And I'm a big fan of that show, Sherlock. Any any more Sherlock coming up? Or is Benedict Cumberbatch too busy being a superhero now? Benedict seems to be a little too busy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think they felt like they, I, I think they just, he got so many offers from so many places that I think Sherlock was just couldn't fit into the schedule anymore. But um, it is, I think, one of the most brilliantly written and directed. I, I've Some of the shows I, I just think are a masterclass in creative directing. So um, yeah, we wish we had more too, but I think that's it, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. That's a that's a great preview for what's coming up. Really uh, yeah. looking forward to those. Um, Suzanne, how I, all are you, how are you all working during this hmm. shelter in place? You know, WGBH Massachusetts basically shut down on March thirteenth, and we all had to get out of the building. And the people who were most concerned were all of the post production people, and because. Uh, because of all the security measures, you know, they can't easily take media out of our company, work on their computer and send that media back because they might send back a virus. And so very quickly, WGBH had to make it possible for all the post-production people to be able to work from home on their computers. And they did it. And, you know, there are a few glitches, no question it takes people longer. It really takes people longer, but, um, but we're doing it and um, it's kind of an interesting experience. I, I feel in some ways, 
you know, the Zoom calls we have, the staff calls and all of that, uh, you know, we know so much more about each other now, about where we live, you know, cats and dogs and kids and, you know, all of that, that it's kind of been fun. It's kind of made it a little more fun that way. We were very lucky because we did six years of Downton Abbey. And I can tell you that was a 24 seven job for mm. six years. And that really brought the staff together. And, you know, I, I could leave and they could just make the whole place run. They're, they're great people. They're really great people. Well, Let's talk about Down Nabby. I mean, that was such a huge, huge hit for you guys. Um, and, and so popular. And I'm, I'm curious about um, what it is about this um, type of show uh, that seems to offer a, a nostalgia for, I mean, what, what I think we can all agree is a, you know, very problematic and outdated class system. Um, but there's something that we we love seeing, you know, those beautiful rooms and the, the the plates placed just so and the chairs the right distance away from the table and, you know, the the beautiful costumes and all of that. Like how, how what is it about um, about a show like that, that that is um, really getting into uh, the class differences and, and, and looking at this um, this society that we've we've moved away from and and has this definite aspect of nostalgia about it is there something problematic in that what what is it about that that um, that is so appealing to American audiences you know it, it really is the million dollar question because of course if you could figure that out then we just keep making down <laughs> but um, you know I think some of the things we started to ask ourselves was, did it come at a time when Americans really needed to feel reassured? Because certainly the show is about uh, the Lord of, a manor, of the manor house who is kind and generous and takes care of everyone. So is that something we needed to see at that time? Is it like a fairy tale? You know, this is how life could be, you know, perfect. Was it because they all pulled together in some ways. So it felt like a community that we wanted to be part of. Um, I don't know, were we longing for something, you know, in terms of our past? Did, did we think this is our, this is how our ancestors lived? So in some ways we were living the life of our ancestors, their closest English speaking relatives. I, I don't really know. But for myself, I think what I found was as much as I, believe me, I loved looking at the house and the costumes and I, it was a very attractive cast too. Um, you know, the young girls and Matthew Crawley and, you know, everybody was great and it was funny. You know, the Dowager had very funny lines, but I, I feel it was the characters for me that really kind of kept me in that show. And I know that Julian, you know, it was all about the characters for him. He felt he was doing something different, which was he wanted the downstairs characters to be equal to the upstairs characters. He felt it was very important that those stories be as important. And he actually created, he told me this one time, and I don't get to tell this to many people, but I found it so interesting was that he created mirrors. So Mr. Carson, who was the downstairs butler, was the mirror of Lord Grantham, right? He's running all the downstairs and, right? So he's the mirror. And then Mrs. Patmore, who was very funny, was the mirror of the Dowager Count Countess upstairs. And then this one really surprised me. Thomas, who was kind of the evil butler, Lady Mary. What? Yes, I know. Shocking. Yes. But, you know, it was very important to him to create a, a really big cast of characters. He was very funny about it. You know, he would say, you know, people like this character, character or not, but, you know, if they just wait a minute, there'll be another one that they'll like. So, you know, <laughs> I'm not worried. They, they can just keep watching and, you know, there'll be somebody that, you know, shows up. So, you know, for me, I, I just feel that it was the characters that really kept the show going. I think some of those initial, you know, 
beautiful places, you know, doing things. It was very aspirational if you were into, you know, hunting or things like that. So, <laughs> you know, and maybe the other thing too, it was a very good hearted show. You know, it was a very good hearted show. I mean, people were trying to do the right thing. They were trying to help each other. I don't know, maybe that was something we needed to see. Mm. You know? I remember I watched one of those uh, behind the scenes features on Downton Abbey to, and there was the, the gentleman who was the expert on the historical accuracy of everything. Um, and what a fascinating guy. I mean, just knew every detail of how all of the, every, uh, everything needed to work. And he was talking to the extras about, you've got to do the, your hat this way and you know, yeah. um, all, all that stuff. I mean, there was such attention to detail in that show. I, I'm so glad you mentioned that because, you know, I, I mentioned I have a documentary background. So when I was on the Downton set, that person, Alistair Bruce, who was the historian, was giving me a tour. And he was telling me about things and what he did on the set. And as a documentary producer, I looked at him and I thought, oh my, you would be such great talent. Oh, it'd be such a great show, Manners of Downton Abbey. So I convinced PBS and our sponsor, Viking Cruises, to fund two documentaries with him, The Manners of, uh, Downton Abbey and more manners mm -hmm. of Downton Abbey. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was fascinating to see everything had a rule. Yeah. Rules. Yeah. So and the chairs used to have like knives in them to keep you from <laughs> leaning back, teach children not to lean back in their chairs. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I was in it for Maggie Smith, 100%. <laughs> I'm obsessed with Maggie Smith. Yeah. Um, I love the Dowager so much. Yeah. You know, a couple times I had to watch the show in a, show in a, in a theater and her lines are so funny that people laughed for so long. You missed a lot of the next dialogue because people were still laughing at her lines because they're so funny. Yeah, she was great. Um, we have another question from the chat, which is, which is uh, sort of goes along with all of this is how, how do you balance the desire for historical accuracy with the desire to create opportunities for greater diversity? Wow, that's a really important question. And, um, you know, I'll just tell you, I'll tell you the experience that I've had in this entire time uh, around the conversation around racial, racial justice. Um, we have a number of colleagues who are black and we were on these Zoom calls and that actually came up as a question in one of the Zoom calls. And I remember a, a colleague said, you know, it, it's time, it's not an excuse anymore. It's just not. And David Oyelowo, who was in uh, Les Miserables said something that, you know, he actually did research and found out there were black policemen in France at the time. So it's not that it isn't there, it's that we haven't gone looking for it. We haven't done the research, you know, and you have to really do the research because there's not as much written down about that history. So um, really what I've been doing is now having conversations with all of our UK uh, producers about diversity and, uh, you know, both, you know, storylines, characters, casting, but also crew members, writers. We're right now um, looking uh, for a script editor who could work with us to look at our scripts before we go into production to really help us shape um, some of the characters and uh, to help us, you know, read additional scripts so that we can find storylines that might not, you know, come to us automatically. So I think we've made a commitment um, that we're going to do more. And I feel like our UK partners are doing that. And the BBC has now committed about $125 million over three years to actually develop uh, writers and storylines and producers and and so, um, you know, we're we're very happy about that. But it's not an excuse anymore, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. 
Thank you for that. Um, uh, you talked about this a little bit, but I'm curious about, about how it actually works. Originally, Masterpiece, um, it sounds like got to start importing existing British television shows to America, but now you're very much involved in the production and the, the development of these shows. How does, how does that work? Well, what's been happening is that um, BBC and ITV, we had all, always counted on them to commission shows that work for Masterpiece. But it turns out costume dramas are not working very well in the UK market, but they work beautifully for us. So what we've done is we've gone to some of our favorite UK producers, people who've made things like Poldark and Victoria, and we've said to them, we really want to develop a show. We'll come in as a bigger financial partner. And the reason that we're able to do this is by starting the Masterpiece Trust um, almost 10 years ago, we have created a pot of money that we can now use for specific projects so we can pay more to get something off the ground, which is not something that we have been able to do with our PBS funding. That just allows us to you know, get the basic shows on air, but not to do more. So um, we're in a good position right now, and we have uh, two costume dramas that we're in the process of developing. And uh, I had been developing a murder mystery that now looks like we're going into production in February. And uh, it's based on a book called Magpie Murders by Anthony Horowitz. And we just announced it uh, this week. And, um, you know, it looks like we'll, we'll get that one launched too. So, you know, we're trying to get projects we really want off the ground, even if the UK commissioners aren't ready to do it yet. So that's working. I love hearing that um, American audiences um, love the costume drama. I know I'm a sucker for the costume drama. I thought it was because I was a theater person, though, if I'm being honest. But it makes me chuckle to hear that UK audiences are like, mm, been there, done that. I've been there, done that. And it's, it's kind of like, I really, honestly, we had Sanditon. I don't know if you watched it, but it was Jane Austen. Mm. Uh, it, it, a novel that was an unfinished novel. And honestly, our audience loved it. You know, anything Jane Austen, you know, that we can get. So anyway, we, we know that. So we're going to keep it going. And Rebecca reminds me that, you know, the British audience, things come into fashion, you know, and they go out of fashion. And so, you know, maybe there was a lot of Downton Abbey and now it has to swing a little bit the other way and then it'll eventually swing back so I'm not going to give up <laughs> I also really love you um affirming the the question in terms of diversity because I know um here in the U.S. there are so many um British actors actors of color I don't I, I know the Brits use some different terminology but so many um black and South Asian descent actors in the UK mm -hmm. that are so stellar and so amazing. And we hear time and time again um, that they come to the US sometimes to get opportunities that they're not getting in the UK. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to hear that to the degree that you can be working <laughs> on yes. making sure those opportunities exist on both sides of the pond. Yes. Um, it's great. We're, we're really trying. I mean, as you can imagine, um, these big companies like Netflix and Amazon, you know, they are the draw now. And um, because every producer, every actor wants to be in a production that's a big production, that has a lot of money, that has a lot of marketing money, you know, and, and we've watched over time as many of these British actors who really, truly are quite brilliant, um, you know, and they go back and forth between the theater and um, doing film and television, but many of them now have American agents, not just British agents. So there's more and more kind of draw to come over here. So we are, we're trying to push back. <laughs> Suzanne, what, what do you personally like to watch that's not Masterpiece? What, what's, your, what's your pleasure, um, you know, TV watching or film watching? What, what, are, what are you into? You know, it's, you know, I have to be careful because 
if I say home and garden channel, will people be disappointed? <laughs> okay, so. Uh, it's all good, you're among friends. No, I, I have to say, I probably gravitate towards a lot of the HBO material. So Succession and shows like that, I really love. Unorthodox was a show I really loved this year. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of some normal people, which uh, had an actress, Daisy Edgar Jones, who we almost had for one of our projects. So that's why I ended up watching that show. But, you know, I, I love all the big dramas uh, that are on television. I, I also like thrillers. I, I tend to want to watch a good thriller, every, not graphic violence, just a good psychological thriller. Um, one of my favorite shows that Masterpiece had, I, I don't know how many of you watched it, was Mrs. Wilson with Ruth Wilson, that was a real story about her grandmother and who she had married, and then it turned out that he had three other families on the side. So a piece like that, that is really a, a piece about a woman who is having kind of things revealed to her like, you know, onion peels and all the rest. I, I thought that was just a brilliant show. So that, you know, I love even some of our shows too. <laughs> Suzanne, and do I you, wonder, oh, oh, go ahead. I just, um, I just wonder, uh, people I think are always so curious about the overlap or intersections between theater and TV and film. And I just wonder if you at any point ever studied theater or did any theater training? I never did any theater training. I honestly would never step in front of a camera. Even this is like not my favorite thing to do. <laughs> but so you're all very brave <laughs> to have gone through theater and uh, been through acting and all of that. No, I feel much more comfortable behind the scenes. I was a director, writer, producer of documentaries for many years. I love making films, I just do. It's um, something I just totally enjoy. And uh, it's like a team sport, theaters like that too. Um, to have so many creative people in one place that you're working with, it's just, it's, it's a joy. It is a joy. It is a joy, yeah. So, no, I, I take film courses, but not, not theater. <laughs> I know you. I know you dropped theater from the name, but I'm I'm curious if you ever get out to the theater. I know you're in Boston. You go to the Huntington. You go to any of the the great theaters in in the Boston area. I do the ART. I live in Cambridge, so the ART is within walking distance. So you know, I can just show up one night when I have free time and see. Uh, oh, who did LBJ? Um, the person who did Breaking Bad. I'm going to... Brian, Brian Cranston. Cranston, yeah. So, you know, I could just walk over, get a ticket, go see Brian Cranston as LBJ. I, it's really lucky. We have a couple of excellent theaters here. Um, just over the years, too, I have, um, you know, friends who are actors and directors in the theater, a good friend who is a casting director, you know, for the theater. So in Boston, because we're smaller... I think that that, you know, film, theater, actor community is a little more, it's mixed up a little bit. It's, it's not so separate. We're, we're kind of all together in that way. So. All right. Well, thank you so much. We have, we have one more question for you, which is a question we like to ask at the end of the episode. Um, what's, what's bringing you joy this week? In the middle of this pandemic, in the middle of shelter in place, what's, what's bringing you joy? Great question. What brings me joy? And I actually have a great answer for that because just before I got onto this call, we got news that um, Glenda Jackson has won a BAFTA for a show that was the very first show I commissioned when I became executive producer. It's called Elizabeth is Missing. And it's a contemporary drama about the Glenda Jackson character thinking her best friend has gone missing, but nobody believes her because she's showing signs of dementia. 
and it's really fabulous. And Glenda Jackson has not been on television in 27 years. And she was on Masterpiece 50 years ago in Elizabeth R. One of my favorite programs of all time. Wow. Linda Jackson, Maggie Smith, Imelda Stuntke. You see a theme, these, these dames? Oh. Ah. You know, I, I feel like Masterpiece, the joy, you know, of Masterpiece is that, you know, we've been able to bring acting royalty to people. I, I mean, just the list, we before our 50th anniversary, we've been going through the list of our, and it's incredible, including the more recent ones like the Benedict Cumberbatches and Martin Freemans. And, you know, it's just, we have been very lucky, very lucky, you know. So anyway, that's what brought me joy today was the bathroom for Glenda Jackson. <laughs> well, we just had a question on YouTube actually, there, uh, right before you, you said that. Any details for the upcoming Glenda Jackson project? Uh, well, it's going to lead off our anniversary season. So it's going to air on January 3rd. It's a 90 minute program and we'll certainly be letting people know about it. We hope everybody has a chance to watch. And another great program coming in our anniversary year is All Creatures Great and Small. Heartwarming story about a vet in the 1930s in the Yorkshire Dales. People will love it. It's a great show too. Well, Suzanne, thank you so much. This was a great conversation. Thank you so much for, for taking the time and joining us and speaking with us today. Well, it was yes. a real pleasure to meet both of you, Josh and, and Don, and, and I wish you lots of luck with your theater. I, I told you I had been there one time before and, and heard a read through and it was excellent. And I just wish you all the very best during Thank this Thank you. Time. Thank, Thank you. you so much. We look best forward to me. having you back in our building when we can be back in our building. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me know. Okay. <laughs> we all will. Right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thank Suzanne. You. So we want to remind everybody about our memberships. You can uh, go to our website, auroratheater.org, and click on memberships to find out how you can become an Aurora Theater Company member and participate in all of the online programming and possibly in-person programming that we're presenting over the next 12 months. Uh, and while you're there, you can also donate by uh, clicking the donation button up at the top right. And I guess I'll also do this. Um, uh, we like to uh, advocate for another organization each week um, at the end of the episode. So this week we are talking about Youth Uprising. Youth Uprising envisions a healthy and economically robust e East Oakland powered by the leadership of youth and young adults, as well as improvements in systems and environments that impact them. Primarily focused on providing support for systemic change, Youth Uprising offers programs in health and wellness, civic engagement, artistic expression, career development, and social enterprises, youthuprising.org. So go check them out. Great. We are off next week as this closes our season one of Aurora Connects and Aurora's 1920 season. Um, but we will be back on August 14th for the first episode of our second season, which will feature Josh and I in conversation. So if you have questions you'd love to hear Josh and I ask one another, or if you have suggestions for future episodes, guests you'd like to see on the show as we plan our season two and season three of Aurora Connects, please pop something down there in the comments or the chat or email us at connects at auroratheater.org, connects at auroratheater.org. Until then. That's it for this week. That's it for this season. This was not the season we expected. Um, we did we did half the shows we thought we were going to do, uh, but we've made some new plans. We made some big plans, um, and and we've had some good times along the way. So thank you all for for being part of the Aurora family. Thank you for staying connected. Suzanne, thank you so much. I, I realize my entire house has gone dark. I, I have to. You're so right about the light. How to 